Thank you, my brothers and sisters. This I deem indeed a grand privilege to be here this morning to speak to these the servants of Christ and my uh, colleagues in the gospel, fellow workers. Um, not much to make speech. I have no uh, ability to do that. And I would just like to get the man together, and sometimes that way, especially those who have uh, uh, what we would call in the world, kind of stuck out their necks in, to sponsor, you see, one of the meetings. And I would uh, like to give uh, the, the reason for the hope that I'm contending for and let you, brethren, see that it's, that it's not uh, full of, uh, uh, of superstitions. It's, it's the gospel. Uh, many years ago when I made my first trip to Phoenix, Arizona, where I was just enjoying my breakfast this morning with my good friend Carl Williams over here in the corner. I guess you're all acquainted with Brother Carl Williams. Um, would you just stand up, Brother and Sister Williams? He's the he's a president of the chapter of the Full Gospel Businessman at uh, Phoenix, Arizona, Brother and Sister Williams. And um, so um, <clears throat> he's been proven to be a very precious friend to me. Last week in the meeting, and our week four last in Phoenix, um, I was telling about when I made my first trip to Phoenix. I remembered as a little boy, I watched and read everything that I could because it was my idea someday my father was a writer and I wanted to be a cowboy. I'd read some Western magazines and seen too many movies as a little boy. And uh, so I'd seen my father ride, and I thought, surely I could ride too. My ambition was to come west and, and be a rider. And I'd heard of the superstitious mountain, of course, the Lost Dutchman, which I believe is the Lost Dutchman mine, which I think is a legend. And so many people now are in our country there. It's becoming rodeo time, and everybody wearing blue jeans, a big hat. They're trying to live in a, a past age. They're living something that was done live by. And I wonder why they do that. There's something in them to make them do that. But you see, I think that's what's the matter with our Christian economy today. We're trying to live in an age gone by, what somebody else said in some other age. And that won't work for this age. But it's strange that they want some old-fashioned idea, some barn dance or some cowboy, something other like that. And that real thing in them that makes them want to go back there is the gospel. They want a new decorated gospel, something to meet this day here, some fine fantastics and fine culture and educations. But they don't want the old-fashioned gospel where that real thing in them that makes them want to go back, that's where it should go back to that. But instead of that, they go back to, to something else. And then when the, something is displayed from God, it's very astounding, unusual to them and not according to their ethics and, and they don't want to accept it. No one would have any more respects for John Wesley, Sankey, Moody, Fink, uh, Finney, Knox, Calvin, any of those men that any of us ministers who appreciate man of God that would have for those men. But you see, we're coming on up. We're not in that age. Each one of them served in a different age, in a different measure. We're serving God today in a different measure from what they were. If there is a tomorrow, there'll be an age, there'll be a gospel for that age that'll still advance until the whole thing is complete in God and God becomes one with us. Now, I remember the morning I took a flashlight. I couldn't wait to see the superstitious mountain. I had to go up there. But my little flashlight was nothing. I couldn't see nothing. It, the great spooky shadows and the man that's been killed on that mountain in search for gold. And it, it held many superstitions, truly. And as I tried with my little flashlight to look around, I, I couldn't couldn't see nothing and everything was scary you know what I did I just sat still until the Sun come up when that Sun which is a king of all light when it raised up my little flashlight didn't play anything but all the spooks left I seen superstitious mountain wasn't spooky I was ready to walk into it to discover it for myself because that great light the Sun which is the spoken word of God God said let there be light and that's the Word of God made manifest. And when it showed, all the spooks left. And I think that way today where I've been so misunderstood amongst brethren. May the great light, the king light, there's no other light. There's none of our manufacturing lights will shine out there today. No matter how many ballparks we throw, you can't see nothing. You have to look right into its face to see any kind of light at all. 
this sun puts it all out because it's a manifested Word of God. And I think when the manifested Word of God rises over all of our superstitions, they fade away. See, we are wanting to know what is truth. What is the hour that we're living? And brethren, we sat here this morning as many different denominations, representing different denominations. I don't think that counts. I used to herd cattle up in Colorado. I remember a time when I would have the roundup in the spring, drive the cattle up into the Repertoire Forest. I sat there many days, my leg hung over the horn of the saddle, and watched the ranger as he counted those cattle as they went through the drift fence off of private property up into the forest. Each ranch to put a cow in there has to have be able to produce a bale of hay, I believe a, a bale of hay, a ton of hay, well, I think it's two ton to a cow. Depends on how much the, the Chamber of Commerce will let you go in there with your brand because in this brand, this ranch produces so much hay, then you put a cow on grazing up there in the forest. That is, the forest is not overrun by cattle and just enough to take care of them because everybody would be coming in. And I noticed it was a Hereford Association that grazes that forest and that part of it, the Repertoire Forest. Now watch the ranger. Now we, ours is the old turkey trot, turkey track. The tripod was just above us. Mr. Grimes worked about 15 men. He had several hundred heads of cattle. And we had a few cattle there. Outfit I was working on, four or five hundred head. But Grimes went into maybe 15, 1800 head. It was a bar, diamond bar. Now watch the ranger. He has to stand there and count those cows as he goes through. You know... He never paid no attention to what brand they had on them. There's one thing he checked was a blood tag in the ear because they had to be a registered Hereford before they could graze. That's on account of keeping your pedigree. See, uh, your cow must be bred, your calf must be from a pedigreed bull. And therefore, after so many cows, you have to have a bull. And they all mix together. All has to be registered pedigreed cattle. Third bread, you keep your, 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 the bloodstream running right then of a Hereford Association. I thought many times that's the way it'll be at the judgment. He'll not notice what brands we're wearing, but he'll look for that blood tag. Jesus Christ. He'll work. If we tried to make all of us this morning assemblies of God, we couldn't do that. If we try to make them Pentecostal holiness, we'd never do that. If we try to make them united churches, we'll never do that. But there's one place that we can meet, all of us as believers, under the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's the only place that God ever met man or ever will meet man is under the blood of Jesus Christ. That's where we have things in common. Recently, I was reading of where a young couple was separating, and it was a pitiful thing. They, they had lived together for several years, and a disagreement had come up among them, and the little mother and little lady and her husband was going to separate. And they were, the attorney was a friend to him. He said, now, before we have get somebody up there and sell these things and take what you got, if you're going to have the divorce, then just uh, divide the spoils among yourselves. They said they would do that. They went into the parlor. They fussed. They fought and everything else over what was in the parlor. They went into the living room. And they, and, uh, they did the same thing there in the dining room and kitchen. Finally, they remembered up in the attic that they had some stuff stored away up there. So they both went up into the garret, I guess you call it here. East, we call it up in the attic. So they went up there and pulled out an old trunk. And they had some clothes and things. that. So they were reaching and fussing over this and that. And after a while, when they lifted up something, they both reached for it. And their hands caught each other's hands as they grabbed. It was a little pair of white shoes. It was to a, a baby had been granted to their union, but had passed on. They're holding each other's hands. One couldn't say it's mine. The other couldn't say it's mine. It was something they had together. Just a few moments, they looked at each other. One couldn't claim it, and the other couldn't claim it. So it was in one another's arms. And the divorce was annulled. I want to see that. We Baptists, and we Methodists, and we Assemblies, and Church of God, and whatever it might be, we might have things all different and everything like that. That's our own traditions that's got us into that. But there's one thing we have in common, brother. Christ. He's the Word. That's what we're here to do. Not talk about our differences, but talk about what we have in common. Jesus Christ. Now let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thou art our Father. 
we thank Thee because of today we have the hopes of eternal life through the blessed resurrection of Jesus Christ. We see the evening lights are shining. The tree that the palmer worm left, the caterpillar eaten, the caterpillar left, the locust eaten. And we realize that these insects are the same insect just in another stage of his life. And we realize that church differences is still the same old Roman insect that started at Nicaea. What one leaves, the other eats. And it looked like today that we're in such a chaos and now going into the, the great council, ecumenic council of churches. Look like there would be nothing left. Hopes is gone. But we remember the infallible Word of God. As the sun rolls up to show the superstitions up, so have you promised, I will restore, saith the Lord. All the years that the caterpillars destroyed and the palmer worms and so forth, how they would be restored again and that tree would live again. We pray, Father, that you'll send down grace and the resurrection power of Christ that you might restore, resurrect us to a living faith in the living word of this day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> I'm a little hoarse, brethren, not being a speech maker, but just a time to get together that you'll see what I mean. I'm here. If you catch me doing anything outside of this word and what's promised for the day, you owe it to me to come to me. You owe it to me to come tell me. But as I say, there's one thing we can agree upon. is Christ. We have it in common. He died for all of us. We're under that blood. Now, I'm not here to do nothing but to try to help each one of you man that this community will be a better place after the revival because we have come together for this purpose. We've come together for this. To, to get acquainted with each other, to know each other better, to have fellowship with each other. That's why I'm here this morning. That was our purpose of having this meeting here. So that we get to know one another. Now we do realize that through all ages it's always been that way. Little something phenomenal be done. Or something different. You have a bunch of carnal impersonations following it. And you have all kinds of superstitions. And it's just to be that way. That's the way it's supposed to be. And things are said about that that isn't true. We know it's always been. Jesus was supposed to be an illegitimate child. He wasn't. He was exactly the way the Bible said. Those men who called him that. He was a manifestation of the Word of God made clear. And you notice they said his disciples come and stole his body away. Paid off the Roman soldiers. They still believe that. But we believe and know by His living presence now that He raised from the dead. And He's sure with us now. We are sure and know that. Every word that He spoke of and promised through the ages has been fulfilled. If you'll watch it. There's nothing could do it. Only God. We are His servants. And now, I thought this morning that I would just read a little text out of the Scripture and speak to you, brethren and sisters here. And we might just have a little come together. Uh, that wind ain't doing me too good up there. Uh, you're, you're, that's all right. Just let alone right now, Brother Roy, because I'm just going to stay a few minutes. A few years ago, about 15 years ago, I was, used to hunt with a man that was a barber, and he was also a chiropist. That's cutting calluses from feet. And you know, during those times, it was hard going. There was no money. And this barber friend of mine, I combing my hair and had he's cut my hair rather than he had dandruff on the shoulder he said Billy I said you have to I have to give you a little shampoo he said you got so much dandruff on your coat and I said alright Jimmy and he talking about coon hunting and he reached back I was his pastor he taught Sunday school he was a fine man to get what he thought was this lucky tiger shampoo to throw on my head and it was carbolic acid and I, I wore a stocking cap in my pulpit for weeks Today, that still bothers me. See, just that little... See, my scalp is still soft, you see. And no, that, that, that's all right now because it was that last night and I just get choked up. My wife bought me a piece of hair to wear. I couldn't wear a hat in the pulpit. It's disrespectable to Christ. If you wear a little cap, they say you want to be a bishop. And it's just a problem. 
She bought it for me, but I have never had the nerve to wear it. I wish I did, <laughs> but I, I haven't. But I'm afraid it reflects something, and you know, and and um, I just have to let it go, I guess. <laughs> and now, I just want to read some of the scripture where God's word never fails; mine will. But I want you to remember this: that in each age, that. God, in the beginning, is the Word. He always was the Word. And the Word is a thought that's expressed. See? Now, in his thinking, what he had, the whole plan, knowing the end from the beginning, he's just expressed it in words, and those words are manifested, just like the sun. That's God's Word manifested. He said, let there be light, and there was light. And there's a time of separation. There was a time when God separated the light from the darkness. He always does that. There's a time that He separated the land from the earth, or the water. He separated Paul and Barnabas. He separated Moses out of Egypt. See, He's always a separation. And there's times come, people, man who carry these ministries don't like to do that, but it must be done. See? There's a time that the disciples had to separate themselves from their own people, Paul, Turn to the Gentiles, away from the Jews, God's heritage. A time come where he had to do it. They talked against him, but he made that famous word, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. May I say that same thing, brother? See, the vision of today. See, the vision of the promise of today. The Holy Spirit in, in the land today. God promised that in this day he had poured the Holy Spirit out upon us. Now, I've crossed the country back and forth. there has been phenomenal signs. As you notice... Not one time has them signs ever failed. They're perfectly the truth because it's God. Tens of thousands times thousands times thousands and not one of them can fail. They call it a devil. They call it everything. Some says one thing and another. But Jesus said, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his disciples? So Jesus said, search the scriptures in them. You think you have eternal life? They are they that testify of me. Now, not they wouldn't testify of me. I'm a human. But the message that's went forth, it testifies of that. Now, God doesn't send phenomena just to show that He's God. God show, sends a phenomena to do this, to declare something. A ministry goes forth in phenomena, and all, after all the carnality and stuff that follows it, as I read of Martin Luther the other day, he said it wasn't a mysterious thing that he, could, that he could take and protest the Catholic Church and get by with it. The phenomenon of Martin Luther was he could hold his head above all the fanaticism that followed the Reformation. That's what we must do. Is everything goes on. And that puts spooks before you, brothers. But remember, the true light, when it rises, it puts all them spooks away. See? It, may, it puts the spooks to shame. It shows them up. And so we know that where the phenomena is done, a mixed crowd always goes. Moses done the phenomena, and there it went into the wilderness. Korah tried to say, well, now you try to say you're the only one that can do this. There's a more holy man besides you. You know what's taking place, don't you? God said, just separate yourself from him. See, See we always have that. When the supernatural is done, the impersonators follows it. It's got to be that way. And that impersonation is what brings in... if. Like Congressman Upshaw, his widow flew in last night to be in the meeting here. He was healed in the services, you all understand. He always had this expression, you can't be nothing that you hain't. <laughs> That's exactly right. You can't be nothing that you, you're not. If we could just, like a great symphony, we would just follow the beats as the composure is beating it out, we would see. Now we, we come to this thought. That the hour that we're living, the time that we're in now, that we have come to the spot to where we're watching for God. When you, brethren, first started your reformers, the Pentecostal move many years ago, when the restoration of the gifts, the speaking in tongues, and things come into the church, God restoring the gifts back into the church. You remember, you all had a reformation too. Your fathers did. It was hard to pull away from Presbyterian, Lutheran, Baptists, and so forth in that Reformation. The Nazarenes were their bloom in them times. So was the Pilgrim Holiness. They rejected your message. 
What happened to them? You see where they're at today? Now remember, we can do the same thing. When a church ever organizes, a message ever organizes, it goes to the shelf and never rises again. Now you're historians here. I know one of you. And that's right. It never rises again when it organizes. Catholicism was the first organization called in the Bible a whore. She was a mother of harlots, the same thing. Organizations. You see where it's all winding up again up here in the ecumenical council? Now, I'm put out because of that amongst the organizations. And brethren doesn't realize what they're doing. It's not me. I'm not put out. They're putting the word out. The Bible said in this lady of Sia, age of Christ was on the outside of the church, knocking, trying to get back in. There never was an age like that. On the outside. Of course, there's not going to be no more church ages. This is the end of it. The lady of Sia was the last age. And Pentecost is that lady of Sia age, and we know that. There'll never be no more above Pentecost. That's it. Like a man, no, no, no creature ever come up from its evolution, coming up into a higher species than, than a man because a man is in the image of the God who created him. There'll never be nothing higher. This is, the Word wouldn't let it go any farther because He is the Word. And neither can the Word climb above any lady of a church age. And we see Him every one there. Jesus on the outside. Of the church trying to get back in. See, that's what they've done to him when he was here first. He is the Word. And the Word, he was the Word. They say, we got the Word. The Pharisees said, we got the Word. But the real true Word, they was rejecting it. That's the reason Jesus said, search the Scriptures. Amen. They are testifying me. Today we can look back and say, how were they sublime? wonder if sometime we won't look back and say, how were we sublime? See? See, it has to be that way, brethren. It's too bad. But it has to be that. Don't say too bad. I don't mean it that way. God knows what He's doing. See, they don't... They, it's the Word they are rejecting. The Word made manifest. The promise that's made manifest. The promise for this day. And the reason it's done is because people are living in a glare of another light. The greatest robbery that was ever performed was in England not long ago. It was done by false light. A $7 million robbery. The world's never heard of such a robbery. Scotland Yard couldn't catch up with it. As the greatest robbery the world ever had was performed by his false light. May I say this, brethren, with love in my heart for man. God knows that. The greatest robbery the church ever had was a false light, too. Amen. Living in the glare of some other age. What Luther, Martin Luther, Wesley, or what some of our four Pentecostal fathers said. See? That ain't today. Here's the promise for the day. Here's the word. And the... You say, well, you got it interpreted wrong. God's His own interpreter. Amen. When He manifested, what they told the Pentecostal fathers back here 50 years ago that they had the Word interpreted wrong. They know such thing as speaking in tongues. They didn't stand still for that. Amen. God interpreted His own Word. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, to them as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. How could they get away from that? It interprets itself. They don't need no interpretation. And today, this age that we're living now, there's a bride tree coming forth. It's truly, the trees come up. And they, as soon as they organize, they couldn't step any farther. And what happens? If they organize and go out on this limb. Then the limb is pruned according to St. John 15 chapter. He prunes them off. They're never used no more. But in the heart of that tree comes forth the fruit right in the top of it. When the tree is fully matured, it can't go no farther, right in the top. The last church age is here. She's coming to full mature. It's a bride tree. Jesus was a tree of life from the Garden of Eden. You believe that? He was the tree of life. There's a tree in the garden, and one of them was, if you touched it, uh, we have our differences on that, so I won't go into it. But let's say it was a tree of disobedience. And as soon as they touched that tree, all people was to die. And they had to put them away from this other tree, because if they eat this tree of life, they would all live. Knowing right from wrong. That's right. You know that as ministers. We have our ideas on that, and we'd probably differ what the tree was. But we can all know that Christ is that tree of life. For one day at the Jubilee there, when they was drinking and rejoicing, Jesus said uh, about the water, He said that He was uh, the rock that was in the wilderness. 
They said, Our fathers eat manna in the wilderness. And he said, And they're ever one dead. But I am the bread of life. Amen. Amen. That tree of life, it come down from God out of heaven. He that eats this lie, this bread shall never die. That is the bread of life. Now, to make the mockery out of it, the Romans hung him on a tree. Cursed is he that hangs on a tree. To make a mockery out of the Son of God. He was despised, rejected. He came from the highest of heaven and become the lowest on earth. When he was here, he went to the lowest city. The smallest man in the city had to look down to see him. Zacchaeus. He was given the lowest name. He was treated the worst and hung on the, died the cruelest death that could be died. That's what people thought of him. That's what the world thought of him. But God lifted him so high till he has to look down to see heaven. Give him a name above every name. That everything in heaven and earth is named after him. That's what God thought of him. If we're sons of God, the attributes of his thoughts before the foundation of the world, we'll think the same of him. And remember, brothers, he is the word. The message always follows the phenomena. Jesus, as a young rabbi, as he started preaching, healing the sick, everybody wanted him in their church. You know that. But that was just a phenomena. What he had uh, is producing. He caught the eyes of the people. But one day he sat down and began to speak to them. There come the ministry to follow the phenomena. Then nobody wanted him then. It's too bad. But it, it just repeats itself. You'll understand from there on. Let's read in the best of the old Bible here just a little for a little talk this morning, Lord willing. Let's read out of the book of Joshua, the 10th chapter, and beginning with the 12th verse. And now, what time do we get out of here? What time we have to be out of here? Say, well, I'll say within 15, 20 minutes. Would that be enough? It'll be all right. Just a moment. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand still. Stand upon Gibeon and moon thou in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jeshur? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hastened not to go down about a whole day. Now, I'm going to take just a little text from that because I told you I can't make a speech. But I think you understand what I mean. But now, I'm here to put my shoulders with you to help you to press Jesus Christ. Not press organization. Not press persons of the earth, but to press Jesus Christ, who is the manifested Word of God. God manifested. Not just what someone interprets. God doing His own interpretation. God proving what it is. He proves what He is. If the Pharisees had just have seen that, if they could just have read the Scripture where it said these things, they would have seen that God was manifesting His Word by Jesus Christ. He was the Word. And he's still the word. Now, this subject I want to take for about 15 minutes. And I try to make my talk, and I make tapes, as you all hear, three and four hours. But that's on a subject, see? And in your churches, I try to make my talking at night about 30 minutes so I can have the prayer line, wear the people out, then come back. I'm sure you like that better. I used to stay for hours and get in 11, 30, and 12. And now I try to make my service about it. 45 minutes to an hour. I won't take the subject here of paradox. Just the word, a paradox. And I didn't know I was going to have the breakfast. Usually we do, but I thought maybe come up about maybe Saturday or something like that. And Brother Borders told me last night late that it was to be this morning. So I just jotted down a, a few scriptures here that I thought I would refer to for a few minutes. Now, paradox, Webster says... It's something that's incredible, but it's true. That's something that no one can explain. It's out of the rims of the knowledge of mankind. But yet it's true. 
paradox. And now uh, we find out that if you would read in, in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, in the third verse, that this world itself is a paradox. A few weeks ago in our meetings in New York City, I'd come out one night from the Mars Auditorium and we were walking down the street, a son and I. And we, we looked upon the people and there were just thousands and men with uh, hair like women, you know, what they call ratted and, and earrings and leg of tarts on and, and white and colored children, you know what I mean, men and women together and, and, they, and uh, they, a poor old woman fell on the street Nobody picked her up, just went on. And I helped her get her oranges and picked up like that old thing about 70 years old. And she looked at me real strange and went down the street. I spoke to a cab driver about it. He said, Mister, when anybody comes to New York and acts like they're in their right mind, he said, we know he's a stranger. See? He said, them are good people. He said, but they just get into that swing. He said, you take a man that comes here, it isn't long till he's in that same condition. He comes in here to try to do everything. said, you could lay there and die on that street in a heart attack. Somebody think he's drunk. They never touch you. Let you lay there and die. See? They don't mean to be that way. It's just getting in the swing. That's the way we do, brethren, in our church life. We get into a swing of one certain creed or one certain thing, and there we stay. See? We swing with the rest of them. We swing with our organization. We swing with our community. It's just unnatural. Paint your steps red and watch what your neighbor does. They'll do it too. One of your sisters get a certain kind of a dress or a hat and watch what your neighbors does. It's, a, it's an impersonation. It's a matching time. We don't care whether our trousers match our coats. We want our experience to match the Word and God. But walking down the street, Billy said to me, he said, Dan... How does God ever know who they all are? I said, all right, son. Look right straight up towards the skies. And I said, see those two little stars up there almost together? Yeah. I said, if one of them, science tells us, if one of them would start to the earth at a million miles an hour, it would take it millions of years to get here. That's how far it is away. And yet those two stars are closer to each other than we are to the star. Or we're probably closer to the star than they are to us. He said, how does God ever do it? I said, he's infinite. Mm -hmm. We just heard a lecture from Einstein. In this galaxy, in the constellation. And he said, if a, a person could leave the earth, one of his great speeches, last ones, if a person could leave the earth at the speed of light, that's um, 186,000 miles per second. 186,000 miles per second and would travel 150 million light years. He would arrive there. And then it would take him 150 million light years to come back. That would be so many billions of years. You could run a row of nines around the earth and not break it down. And talking about years. You know how long he'd been gone from the earth? 50 years in our time. We're in such a hurry. What if a little ant started from Tucson to come up here to Bakersfield? How far do you think he would get in 40 years? Probably a half a mile. See, it means so much to him. To us, it meant 12 hours driving. To a jet plane, just a few seconds. To God, nothing. Jesus died yesterday afternoon. He was crucified. Paul died yesterday. 1,000 years this is a day. With God, as it was, not even that, but if you want to count the time. So those apostles and things died yesterday. We are hurrying. We got a little bit of time to stay here. Then you think when you look at eternity. Einstein, the great philosopher said, or the great scientist said, that there's only one sensible way to explain the origin of this earth. That was found in Hebrews 11th chapter in the third verse. By faith we understand God framed the world out of things. That he spoke it into existence. How does it stand in the skies? 
never gets out of its orbit. How that everything in heaven and that constellation, if one of those stars that move, I know you go out at night and say, I've seen a star shooting all. You've seen a weather light. Star don't move. <laughs> if that star would move, we'd move with it. Everything in heaven is so much in harmony, it holds one another together. What if mankind could be that way to hold the church together? That we could all be in harmony with the Word. See? Only one way, let God be His own interpreter and we will be. See? God's His interpreter of that. Now we find out that in this is simply a paradox. There's no doubt, but what, that's one of the great paradoxes. Now, there's been so many paradoxes as we come. Things, it, it, it's incredible... But yet it's true. In the days of Noah, you remember, it had never rained upon the earth. There had been no such a thing as rain. The world stood up straight, just equal with the sun. It was disbelief and disobedience that throwed it out of its cater, makes it lean back and cause the hot and cold air to bring up the vapor from the seas and make rain. It had never rained upon the earth. And here comes a man out saying that it's going to rain. Strange thing, but it was a word of the Lord. I can hear science. You say, well, now, how do you know they had science? They built the pyramids in those days. We couldn't build them today. No. We have the material. We have the stuff to build them with. We have no machinery to lift those boulders up there. It's still a mystery to the world. They built it. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. As it was in that day, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And brethren, for a little thing that I might squeeze in here just a moment. Peter quoted it in the first Peter. He said, wherein eight souls were saved by water. Eight souls. What's an ecumenical council of tens of millions? See? That doesn't save. It's a word. God saves. Eight souls were saved by water in the days of Noah. Look what was saved in the days of Lot. Look what ended in the journey through the wilderness to Joshua and Caleb. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. A great scientific age. And no doubt they could shoot the skies and say with the radar and say, there's no water up there. Where's it coming from? God said it will be there. That was good enough. And Noah believed it. And he saved his household. You remember? God tries his people who believes his word. Where God is, is always paradox. Because he does things that's incredible to the human thinking. Did you know that? We all know that. Incredible to the human thinking. And he tries those humans that are predicting this paradox. He gives them trials. Never does he... Omit or change his way. God never changes his system. Do you know that, brethren? Sure you do. He never changes his system. He always keeps it going in continuity, the way he started. He never dealt with a world only under preaching with one man, Noah. He never had four to go down and deliver them or an organization in the days of Moses. He never had two on the earth at the same time. Each one of us different from one another. Our features, our makeup. God just gets a hold. All He needs is one person. Amen. And He can get in control. That's His example. Amen. He did it by Moses. He did it always. When Elijah and Elisha was on earth, they both couldn't stay the same time. One was taken. The other one got his mantle up on him. Amen. When John came up on the earth, he was the manifested Word of God for that hour. Amen. We know that. He was God's manifested Word because why? Isaiah said, There'll be a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Malachi, the last prophet, said, Behold, I send my messenger before my face to prepare the way before the people. Now, that was not Malachi 4. That was Malachi 3. John was Elijah of Malachi 3, not Malachi 4. Because on Malachi 4, when that prophecy comes forth, the earth is to be burnt with a fervent heat and the righteous walk out in the millennium of the ashes. And it never happened in the days of John. In Matthew 11, we find out that when John sent disciples uh, down to, there were, John paid Jesus the least respect that he could after he had already seen the sign over him and said, that's him. 
He had told me in the wilderness to go baptize the water, said, On whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining, he baptized with the Holy Ghost. He said he was sure of that. He saw the sign. Then after his eagle eye got filmed over down in the prison, he said, Go ask him if he really is the one or another. That was disregarding the Word. But Jesus knew that. He paid John a great respect. He said, Who did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft raiment? They don't handle a sword. They're kiss the babies and bury the dead. They're in king's palaces. So what did you go out to see? A reed shake with any wind? When one organization offered him a little more than the other or some community, he'll move to that community called not John. So what did you go to see? A prophet? Said, I say unto you, and greater than a prophet. He was. He was a messenger of the covenant. He was a breach. He was a keystone between law and grace. What did you go out to see? A prophet? And I say unto you, more than a prophet. He said he was a bright and shining light for a while. Why? He was a word made light. He was a word manifested. Then when he come on the scene, he said, I must decrease and he must increase. Two of them couldn't stay at the same time. John had to go. Jesus remained. See, it's always that way. God did that in the days of Noah. We find out then that that was a phenomena. It was something, what it was a paradox that God floated that ark. When the whole world are rocking with the waves probably bigger than the mountains today. When it swung from it, when them stars moved back or whatever taking place in that world moved out of its orbit. Swung itself out there in those great waves. It was certainly a paradox that that little old wooden ship could rock for 40 days and nights on that, in that water. It was a paradox. It was a paradox that God could bring water out of the skies when there was no water up there to bring. But he can fix the situation to make it suit his word. Amen. He's still like Genesis 22, Jehovah Jireh. The Lord can provide for himself a sacrifice. He, he remains. That's one of his compound redemptive names. It was a paradox when the Hebrew children were stowed into the fiery furnace. How that three men could walk into a furnace so hot that the intense heat even killed the man that were pushing them in. And yet they stayed in that only delivered them. That's the only thing it did. It delivered them from the bonds that they were bound with. It's a paradox. Sometimes in our own lives, that paradox repeats. Sometimes you're brought to a showdown where you have to make a decision. You have to stand on that decision like they did. And it all works together for the good. What did it do? It never hurt them. It loosened them. Sometimes we're caught in that position. First thing, we've got, it's like a man drowning in the river. You've got to get the man out of the river before you can get the river out of the man. <laughs> yeah. And that's sometimes what a man has to do is come out and make his stand. Get the thing out of get him out of the, the thing so he can get the thing out of him. That's what the Hebrew children had to do. They had to get out of the fire. And God caused the paradox to happen. David. We see David. Just a kid. Just a boy. With a slingshot. Not a spear, sword. He was put over some sheep to watch after him. His father's word was to care for those sheep. He was a shepherd. Brethren, that's as we stand this morning. We are shepherds. We don't need a college education. We don't need a bunch of theology. We need the Father's Word. It may seem simple. And when a bear or a stealer comes in and gets one of the Father's sheep and packs it off in some kind of an ism, it's a very small thing that we seem to have it's laughed at, but it's oh so powerful when God's behind it. Go after it. Bring it back. How David could take that slingshot and knock down a lion. I've hunted lions. My, set up on a hill here one day and I guess half a mile away, you've heard them growl around in these circus if you ought to hear a wow and roar once. Rocks roll down off the hill where that fellow roared. And to see that uh, vicious animal like that and this little boy, little stoop-shouldered ruddy fella goes and kills that lion with a slingshot. That's a paradox. It was a paradox when a man with 14-inch fingers by the name of Goliath, a warrior from his youth, covered over with an armor, how that God took the same little slingshot 
and brought down that that giant because that he was protesting the armies of God. It was a paradox. And when we take our stand today, when man say these things can't happen, don't be fussing with them. That's wrong. Don't fuss with them. But pick up the sword. Pick up what you look what's supposed to be this day. When God gave His promise for today, pick this up and go. All the glass will fall under it. It's a paradox. What God's doing today is a paradox. How He can, he, only God can do that. All right. The sling. It was a Moses who was trained in all the, the wisdom of the Egyptians. He could teach the Egyptians science and so forth. And it certainly was a paradox how that God equipped that man. Now look, all of his education, everything he had, it took 40 years to educate him. It took God 40 years to get it out of him. See? See? Get the man out of the water before you get the water out of the man. See? It took him 40 years to take out of him what he had learned. He found out that what he had wouldn't deliver Israel, and that's what he was born for. He didn't have no choice of that. God called him for that. And we found out that it had taken 40 years to get it out of him. And sometime when man really follow the commandments of God, he does things that seems to be uh, uh, kind of, a, I guess, mental to other man. Jesus was considered a madman. But he's doing exactly what the Father told him to do. He was the Word manifested. He was called a madman. Look at Moses with this, his wife, Zephyr, sitting on a mule. And Gershom on her hip, 80 years old, white beard hanging to his waistline, his bald head shining to the skies with a crooked stick in his hand, going down to Egypt to take over. Could you imagine that? They say, where are you going, Moses? Going down to Egypt to take over. How do you know where the Lord told me to? To take over an army, not an army, but a nation. The thing of it is, he did it. That was a paradox. How with a crooked stick he brought the judgments of God up on Egypt and delivered Israel. With a crooked stick, not an army or sword, it was a paradox. If anybody look at the things, that, it's incredible, but yet it's true. It's a paradox when, when, when they can do it, when you do that. Now, we find out also Joshua here that we're speaking of, over here in, in uh, Joshua 10, 12. Joshua... The sun, we say, they tell us today, stand still. The world turns around. They say if the world stops, it would drop. Gravitation holds it in its spot. Now, brethren, what took place? <laughs> he said for the sun to stand still. My teacher in school and teaching the Bible said, he, uh, God winked at his ignorance. But anyhow, it stopped. <laughs> that was the main thing. <laughs> it stopped. And he said here that it stood still for most a whole day. And the moon hung over Agilon. That the sun stood still. Whatever he stopped, I don't know what he stopped. But because of a man Amen. saying, stand still. And it's, it's written here that the sun stood still. Science proves that, that a mark in the sky still says that that's the truth. Can vindicate it by a mark in the skies today that it did take place. Amen. See, that's just been about, about uh, 2,500 years ago or something like that, 2,800 years ago maybe, that it did that. It hasn't had, the mark hasn't had time to trail into the stars and things yet. That's just, that's just two days ago, but God's time, see? But yet the mark shows, and it stood still. That's a paradox. No one can figure out if the sun, if the worlds are turning, then you say he stopped the world. Well, if he stopped the world, then the science says that gravitation is turning, holds it up there, then the world would have dropped itself. But it went right on moving at the hand of God. A paradox. Why? Oh, you say that was a long time ago. That is today the same God. Amen. Jesus said in Matthew uh, not Matthew, it's St. Mark 11, 22. If you say to this mountain, be moved and don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you've said will come to pass, you can have what you said. Amen. That's defy nature. 
But you have to have a motive and objective to that is connected with it. Find out in the Word if it's supposed to be done, and then God's calling you to do it. It'll do it. When you know that it's spoken in the Word to do it, and then God's called you to do it, then it'll happen. Amen. If your motive and objective is right to God. Amen. That's why visions take place. Why things go in the way that you have to know. And know God promised it this hour, as it was in the days of Lot. He promised it in the last days, then He calls to do that. It's no problem. Amen. God said so. That settles it. Sure, it's, it, it's a paradox. You can't explain it. No man can explain how certain things will be predicted and never one time fail to happen. It's a paradox. But God said, do it. It's a day. That's the day we're living in. The sun stood still. Samson, it was a paradox how he could kill a lion barehanded, a little curly-headed shrimp, se separated from God. He was a Nazarite, separated by the Word of God. He was a Nazarite. And so he separated himself for the Word. And he didn't have shoulders the size of that door there. Any man with shoulders like that could kill a lion. That wouldn't be no mystery if he was that size as science or, or the uh, theologists of the day and, and artists try to draw his picture. He was just a little bitty guy. See? And he was totally unable to do it. But when the Spirit of the Lord came up on him, Amen. then he could do it. We might stand alone. We might stand as one or two. Whatever it is, when the Spirit of the Lord is trying to confirm a word that He's promised and told you to do it, it'll happen. It'll be a paradox again. Certainly. It was a paradox when this man could take the jawbone of a mule that he picked up on a field. I remember those Philistine helmets was about an inch thick with brass. Think of it. And he had the jawbone of a mule. Uh, laying out there on the desert, did you ever pick up one? You can kick it with your foot and it'll bust into a million pieces. Hit it against a rock, it just it goes to powder almost. And he tucked this jawbone of this mule and beat down a thousand Philistines. Beat their helmets in. How did the jawbone hold together? Why didn't his arm give out? How could he do it in them trained man with spears? It's a paradox. God made the promise. And where God is, paradoxes always happen. Where God is. Yes, sir. Wasn't it a strange thing? In the days that when King Ahab was king and, and uh, 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 Judea uh, and uh, Israel, rather, and, and Jehoshaphat, the righteous man, king of Judea, of Judah. And they made an alliance. There how a believer can get connected with a with a make-believer. Sometimes man gets in that kind of a fix today. Mix themselves up with people who don't believe the Word. And yet they're bound into them with such ties that they can't get out. They're afraid to accept it. I admire your brother's courage. Amen. Now, you don't have to have that interpreted. See? see? When they deny, it won't have nothing to do with it, get it away. And yet you'll step right out and sponsor. Amen. I admire a man like that. Huh? You're not afraid of the Caesars and the commandments. Yeah. Believers being hooked up with make-believers. And Jehoshaphat did that when he went out to Ahab, that lukewarm, borderline believer. Thought more of the social things of the world and his wife's fine hairdos and things than he did of God. Give in to her. We find out that Israel was a very type of this nation then. How they went over and took the occupants out and occupied and had great men like uh, David and Solomon. But finally, there rose up a fellow like Ahab. But in the days of Ahab is when the prophet came on the scene. God always manifests His Word. And we find out then that this nation has done the same. We come in, drove out the Indians and occupied, and we had a Washington and a Lincoln. But well, where are we getting to now? But God can still raise up prophets. He's able of these stones to rise, children of Abraham, when His Word requires it. Malachi said we would have it, and we'll have it. It'll be here. Don't you worry. His Word will be fulfilled. Notice, Micah. 
was down in the country, and Ahab, to kind of make a shine to the country, he had 400 Hebrew prophets down there, a great organization of them. It was all well-dressed, fine-dressed, educated, scholarly man, Hebrew prophets. Now, not heathens, Hebrew prophets. Jehoshaphat made this alliance. I think it all things works together. The symphony is just beating out the beat. So uh, he made an alliance to go up, take the king of Eden and go on up into the land and take the Syrians because it seemed very good. And Jehoshaphat fell on the idea of being a godly man and said, we should consult the Lord, shouldn't we? He said, that's right. Excuse me. I should have thought of that. Yeah, I got a seminary down here. Got the best there is in the country. Most scholarly, they can say, Amen, the prettiest you ever heard. See? We go down and get them. Bring them up. Let them prophesy. Here come the prophets all up. Well, fine dressed man, fine cultured, educated to the dot. They know it all. They're Greek, Hebrew, and all. <laughs> See? They come up and they all prophesied and they had a right to prophesy. They said, Go on up. What's the matter? That land up there belongs to Israel. And that's true. Joshua gave it to us. God gave it and Joshua divided it. And our children are going hungry and the Philistines' bellies are filled with the wheat that's raised on that country. They was absolutely on the word when it comes to that. But they had sinned and they lost that land. They lost it. It absolutely wasn't theirs then. But accordingly, if you want to go back to the foundation, it did belong to them. And the prophets were right. They said, go on up, the Lord's with you. But you know, when a man's really, like I said last night about Joseph, being a just man, there's something didn't ring a bell with Jehoshaphat. He was a righteous man. He said, haven't you got one more? One more and we got the whole seminary here? Mm -hmm. The best we got in the country, Hebrew prophets, and they're telling exactly, look how close they are on the Word. There's, the Word said that this land belongs to us. We got a right to go get it. But Jesus told the devil the same thing. He said, it's also written. That's what they failed to see. That's what made them disbelieve Jesus. It's also written. A virgin shall conceive. They failed to see that. So when they said, go on up. The Lord is with you. He'll give you the victory. Because it belongs to us. It's, it's in the name of the Lord. Here it is. But it didn't ring the bell. Amen. Jophet said, have you got one more that you might consult? He said, yes, there's another, but I hate him. The association won't receive him. Mm. We won't have nothing to do with him. He's Micah, the son of Imlan. So don't let the king say so, said Jehoshaphat. Go get him. So then they sent a forerunner and said, Micah, you want to come back into the fellowship again? See? Just say the same thing the rest of them, saying this is your opportunity now. You agree with the organization, all the rest of them, they'll bring you back. See, And you'll be in fellowship and you can have your campaigns all around over the country then. He said, as the Lord God lives, I'll only say what he puts in my mouth. We need some Micahs. He said, I'll see what God says about it first if he wants me to go back in yet again. So he said, give me tonight. Let me see what the Lord will say. And that night the Lord showed him a vision. He compared his vision with the Word. <laughs> that was right. <laughs> he said, go on up. But I seen Israel like sheep scattered, having no shepherd. So then the one, the high priest of the, of the ecumenical council leader come up and smacked him in the mouth and said, where did the Spirit of God go when it left me? He said, you'll see him. that day when you're sitting inside. He said, where did it go? And he said, he said, I saw God sitting upon a throne. I saw the host of heaven gathered around him. And they're God's prophet. The Word always comes to the prophet. No matter how unpopular it seems to be, it's always there. And the reason they know it is, it makes it so that what the man speaks comes to pass. God said then that's proves it. Then a prophet means not only to speak the word, but also to foretell and a divine interpreter of the word, divine word written. The word came to the prophet. And this is the complete revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the revelation, the Bible. It's revealing Jesus Christ. See? And now when the prophet came on the scene then and could foretell things and it happened exactly like that, God said, remember, I'm with him, man. Then when he revealed the word, what the other prophet had said before him, it come to pass then they know that was true. That still remains God's way of doing it. He never changes his way. See? Remember, the great, great groups tried to change that, but he didn't do it. Here's one we're talking of now. 
And they had a right. But Elijah had told Ahab, see, Israel had accepted the wrong man who had made them organizations and had turned down the true word. And he said, I seen God and a council was held. And he said, who can we get to go down and deceive Ahab? He said, a lying spirit come up, probably from hell. He said, I'll go down and get into those prophets and cause them to prophesy a lie. Hebrew prophets that was looking right at the Word. See? But the, what Elisha said was blinded to them. They thought he was a crank too. Yeah. But when Micah went under the Spirit, he saw exactly what the real prophet had said. That was the chance. That was it. To do it. And them Hebrews was right on their So was the Hebrews right in what they were saying about Jesus Christ. See? But it was according to their shadow that they were walking in. It's the glare of another day, not the light of that day. Could the history repeat itself again? The Bible says it does. See? Now we find out that there was... It's strange that God chose this one little uneducated, unaffiliated with Him to show and bring those people the Word instead of that school. A fine, cultured, educated man. Smart. He chose Micah. That's a paradox. Amen. Sure was. And it happened just the way Micah said it would happen because he had the Word of the Lord. It's always been that way. Yes, sir? John the Baptist was another one. You know, we don't have very much record of where prophets come from, so forth. Spiritual man. See, man picked man. Like they picked Mathenus and so, to take uh, Judas's place. We don't hear very much about him. God chose Paul. Amen. See? See, that was God's choosing and the church's choosing. See? And the same thing, men who are filled with the Spirit are usually men who try to run from the thing. Get away from it. They don't want to do it. But God just takes it and says, I'll show you, I'll make you do it. Paul tried to run. Others tried to run. Many tried to do it. Moses tried to get away from it. We don't have much record of John. His father was a priest. It was a tradition in them days for the son to follow the father. His trade. But when John was born to funny, odd, phenomenal birth, when he was conceived in his mother's womb, we know the story of Zacharias, how the angel said his wife would conceive. And when we find out that's what taken place, six months the baby hadn't moved. And Mary was visited by Gabriel and went up in Judea to salute her because Gabriel told her that she was pregnant. And when she got up there, she told her, she said, she would hid herself. And when she met Mary, they put her arms around Mary and began to hug her as women do, really Christian women, believers, begin to hug her. And she said, um, uh, she seen she was big to be mother. And um, she said, you know, the angel of the Lord uh, told me I was to be mother too. And Mary, Martha, pardon me, Elizabeth said, it was, she's kind of worried she said, because it's six months now, and the baby hadn't moved. That's irregular. See, the baby is practically what we call today dead. See, he's good as dead in his mother's womb. Six months, it troubled her. And, you know, John was six months older than Jesus, which was his second cousin. Mary and, and Elizabeth were first cousins. And then when we find that Elizabeth, Mary looked back her young face, and she said, I I'm going to have a child too. So, oh, you and Joseph are married. No, we're not married. And you're going to have a child. Yes, the Holy Ghost shall overshadow me. Paradox. <laughs> the Holy Ghost shall overshadow me. That holy thing will be called the Son of God. Said, Gabriel met me. And when he did, he said, I have a son and I call his name Jesus. And as soon as he said Jesus, little John began to leap in his mother's wombs. He received the Holy Ghost. The Bible said he's born from his mother's wombs, full of the Holy Ghost. The first time that name was ever called out of a human lip. A dead baby come to life in the womb of a mother. What ought it to do to a born-again church? Amen. That name, Jesus. So why come, when cometh the mother of my Lord? For as soon as thy salutation come to my ear, she heard his name. My baby leaped in the womb for joy. It's quite a phenomenon. It's a paradox. 
John dead six months in his mother's womb come to life through the name of Jesus Christ the first time it was ever spoke by human lip show that dead man would come to life by the name of Jesus Christ still a paradox not another name under heaven given among man whereby you must be saved a paradox yes John was a phenomenon Looked like he would have went and carried out his father's, went to his school where his father was trained at, being a Levite. Levite was the only ones could be in the priesthood. So John was a Levite. So it, ordinarily it was or it is traditional for him to go to the school of his father. But God had a, a work for him. He was to announce the Messiah. His work was too phenomenal for him to follow the traditions. I hope you're reading right. His work was too phenomenal. He couldn't go to their traditions and take up with their traditions. Everybody be saying, now, don't you think that Brother Jones here is just a man to be the Messiah? We know that you're to announce him. Don't you think he's just the right kind of a man? It had been another Mathenus. But what did he do? He stayed in the wilderness. He had no education. John, like many of us today, he could not speak and use the words of grammar that we would express our inspiration by, or man, not myself. Probably most of us in here. Couldn't explain. What did he do? He had to go to nature to parallel it, to bring out his point. Amen. See? When he had the expression, he had to go to nature. Look, he, he said, Oh, you generation of vipers. What he'd seen snakes in the wilderness. He seen that's what they were. Generation of vipers. Now, an educated man would have had some other word, see, that he could use instead of that. But he expressed it by a snake. So don't think within yourselves that because we belong to this... <laughs> That you're going to mean anything to God. Or God's able of these stones. See? Not to take some uh, theological word. He knows nothing about any seminary. He had his seminary in the wilderness. Amen. And before God. It's strange that God would take a man like that. It's a paradox. Instead of all them fine educated priests. That was in the schools. It's quite a paradox. God always works in paradoxes in my opinion. The virgin birth was a paradox. A virgin conceived. Bring forth a child. God made flesh. God changed his strand from, from spirit to become man. Man changed, he changed his tent, his dwelling place, and tabernacle. When Jesus is standing there and upon the shores of Galilee, John looked up and he saw the Spirit of God like a dove descending and a voice saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am pleased to dwell in. In whom I'm pleased to dwell, the same thing. Amen. Verb before the adverb is all. See? This is my beloved Son, in whom I am pleased to dwell in. God and man becoming one, uniting together Amen. for redemption. How God, it covered all space and time, could come down and bottle himself into a man. Amen. So he could taste death for all the human race. Amen. The Creator dying to save his creation. Amen. Heavens and earth kissed each other. Man and God became one. How can a man, now that he might dwell in man in fellowship, it's nothing but God condescending, trying to get to his man. In the beginning, he was a father. He was above all. He was alone. He dwelled alone, Elohim. Even when he come down upon the mountain, even if an animal touched the mountain, it must die. But then he was made flesh, and we touched him, handled him. He did that in order to shed his blood, virgin blood, because we were born by sexual desire. He was born virgin birth. He wasn't the blood of a Jew. Neither was he a Gentile. He was God. Creative blood. See? Jew blood don't save us. Gentile blood don't save us. God's blood, the Bible says, saves us. He was God's blood. Some people said that, he was, that Mary conceived, and that was the, the egg belonged to Mary. The blood cell come from the male sex, which was God. That's wrong, too. If it is, look here. Then to bring that egg down, there had to be some kind of a sensation. Then what do you have God doing to Mary? Amen. He created both egg and blood. He was God. She was an incubator. Amen. She was only a barred womb. Amen. Like a barred grave to be buried in. Amen. He made all. Yes. See? Had not a place to lay his head. He become our example, what we should be. He never took sides with nobody, but did that which pleased the Father, always. And the Father, 
now dwells in us by his death. He sanctified a church that absolutely this church is clean, unclean, filthy, God condescend from the pillar of fire down to me made man and then the Holy Spirit right in us. Amen. Don't you see what it is? Hallelujah. The same God coming down all the time. Now, God above us, God with us, God in us. Amen. Like the thoughts of God, the Word of God, and the manifestation of the Word. Amen. Just the same thing from the beginning. God thinking. A father he was, a son he was, a savior he was, a healer he was. The words are spoken, it was manifested. Virgin shall conceive and bear a son. His name shall be called Emmanuel, counselor, prince of peace, mighty God, everlasting father. And it was, and from that come forth that he might bring forth many sons unto God. The whole thing is God revealed, God with, above us, God with us, God in us. Amen. A paradox indeed, that God would dwell in man himself. Sure he had to become that to die, to satisfy his own laws of righteousness. He predicted and said, the day you eat there, that day you die. And he had to fulfill. He's nobody else could do it but himself. Amen. If, if he, they, today, in this day, I like to bring this, uh, the, the deity of Jesus Christ. Because that man tried to make him a prophet. Now, if he happens to be a Christian sign sitting here, I'm not hurting your feelings. I hope I'm not. But we express so much upon evidences. We Pentecostals put our evidence upon speaking in tongues. And how bad we've been fooled in that. And how many of them says the fruit of the Spirit is the evidence. How badly you're fooled by that. No, sir. If you talk about speaking in tongues being the evidence of the Holy Ghost, which I do believe the Holy Ghost speaks in tongues. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, but you say a man speaks in tongues got the Holy Ghost. We believe that for a while. But we find out it's wrong. Luther said those that said they believe. We found out that was wrong. Wesley said those got sanctified and shouted. We found out that was wrong. Pentecost said those that spoke with tongues. We found out that was wrong. The Christian science said the fruit of the Spirit is the evidence. We find out that that's wrong. I've seen witches and wizards drink blood out of a human skull and speak in tongues and lay a pencil on the table and write in unknown tongues and interpret it. Don't tell me about that. My mother's a half Indian. And I, I know I've seen it and dealt with it. Yet God does speak with tongues. But that's no infallible evidence that you got the Holy Ghost. No. Certainly not. No, indeed. The Christians, now let me, God forgive me for doing this. I'm going to put Jesus on a trial for you just a moment. If you'll forgive me, have I got that much time? Let's see. Just a moment. Just be a, yes, I'm, I'm 10 minutes past time, but I'll hurry and omit some of this. See? Let's just try this just a minute, brethren. Our Heavenly Father, forgive me for this. I don't like to speak it, but it's so that it's people that know. I'm going to take it. I'm going against Jesus this morning, and I'm going to say you're a bunch of Jewish people, and Jesus just rolls up here in Baker's Field. Let me call you man together and talk to you about fruits of the Spirit. They believe that too. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness. Is that right? Fruit of the Spirit. Many people rely upon that. Sometimes that's the devil. He can impersonate that to the letter. He can impersonate speaking in tongues to the letter. Interpretation of it to the letter. Any of those gifts, he can impersonate it. Notice. I'm going to get, there's a priest. I'm going to talk to you all. Now, I'm taking sides against Jesus just a moment. I've asked God to forgive me just so that I can show you what I mean to bring out a point. I'll say, gentlemen, I'm here in behalf of your church this morning. I'm speaking to you all. Now, there's a young fellow in the city here by the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He's got a strange doctrine. We know our priest. Now we have to judge this by the fruit of the Spirit. This your priest, his great, 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 great grandfather was a priest. He omitted all of his young life for the things that you all enjoyed when you were a young man. He omitted that to be a priest to God. What did he do by this? He studied. He'd done everything he could be to be a right kind of a man. Who was it stood by you when Papa and Mama was arguing? Let's go to separate. Who stood by Papa and Mama, put arms around one, one around the other, and brought them back together? Your faithful old priest out there. Your faithful old priest studied Jehovah's laws until he knows them in and out, in and out, in and out. He went through every seminary. He's got a doctor's degree, a bachelor of art. He's got, he's got a DDLL, PhD. He knows exactly what he's talking about. He studied for that while you, man, were running around. He studied because he's your leader. That all makes sense, brothers, if you're talking in a psychological way of it. It all makes sense. What school did this Jesus of Nazareth come from? 
He never had a day in school as we know of. Where did he come from? No one knows. Here he comes around. Look at your old kind old priest. When your daddy ran out of money that time, didn't have no money, who did he go to? The man had the fruit of the Spirit, your kind old priest that loaned him the money to tithe him over until his crops come in. Who stood by you when your mother was in labor? Excuse me, sisters. And they thought she was going to die. Who held his hands up on her and prayed while you was being born in this world? Your kind old priest. Who lifted you up to Jehovah and circumcised you and helped you and made you and offered you to Jehovah? That kind old priest. And look what this Jesus of Nazareth done the other day. What he ever do for the fruit of the Spirit? Now, many of you are a businessman. You have, uh, you have businesses here. You, you're merchants and, and so forth. Jehovah requires a lamb for your sins. You don't raise lambs. So what do these kind old priests did? So that your soul would not be lost. They had some sellers to go up there in the courts. Make little cages and put lambs in there that you could take your income that you would have done or made out of lambs, but you made on something else to keep our economy going. And they play, made a place so you, when you got sin burden and you want to get released from your sins, this kind old priest had a place you could go buy a lamb. God didn't want your money. He said a lamb. And you went and bought a lamb. What did this Jesus of Nazareth done? Come and kick them things out and emptied them up and told them there's a den of thieves. Not much fruit of the Spirit there, is it? Your kind old priest never gets out of humor. This fellow plaited ropes together and kicked the tables over and run them out there and looked angered up on them. That's not fruit of the Spirit. Your kind old priest. Who's going to say the last words over you? Your kind old priest. Who's going to permit commit your soul to God? The kind old priest. See? Through the Spirit. And that fellow had none of them. Now you say, Brother Branham, I could stay a sermon on this, but I won't. What is the fruit of the Spirit? The manifestation of the promised Word. Yeah. If they just to stop the look, he did not have these things that they had, fruit of the Spirit or anything. But the Word that was promised that day was manifesting itself. That was exactly the light of the hour. That was it. See? No matter how much education, how kind, how much you speak with tongues, how much kind, gentle, and everything you are, unless you accept that word of the hour, when it's manifested before you, you're in the same predicament. That might sound crude. I don't mean it that way. But it's truth. Just disbelieve. All right. Now, God, forgive me. You see what I mean? Who had the fruit of the Spirit? Jesus. He said, search the Scriptures. You think they, in them you think you have eternal life? They testify me. They tell you I am. He never did come out and say who he was. Amen. He didn't tell them. And why he got his congregation that great, he said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, as I said last night, you have no life. Well, my, that congregation said, that guy's crazy. What with doctors and science? Well, that man trying to make cannibals. He never explained it. Amen. It was time for him to turn him down. Amen. Then he had a bunch of preachers hanging around him. Borderline believers. He said, well, what are you going to say when you see me ascend up from where I come from? Come from? Well, we've seen the cradle you were born in, the city you were born in. We fish with you out here on the hills. You, we walk with you, talk with you, and you come from... Um, uh, now we know you're crazy. But real genuine faith don't move. Amen. Them disciples couldn't explain it, but they know there it was. Amen. See, it has to be something that God planted. had to be His thoughts before the foundation of the world. When he planned the whole redeem, Ephesians 1, 1 to 5, he planned the whole thing before the foundation of the world, his thoughts, and this is the attributes of his thoughts. Look at Judas standing there as a clergyman up here, just walking in the light, had power to heal the sick. Matthew 10 proves it. He sent them out and they come back rejoicing, and devil's a subject unto him. Judas with him. That's right. He said, don't rejoice that the devil's his subject, but your names are written on the Lamb's book of life. Judas is with him. But when it comes to taking the full Word of God, He turned it down. Amen. So does people today. Amen. See? Jesus said, man shall live by every word. Not just one or two words, every word. Amen. You say, well, Brother Bram, I can go for part of it and I can't go. Then you got the interpreter Eve had. That's right. <laughs> he took every bit of it and interpreted it right, but one little phrase. Amen. It's got to be every bit of it. If the Bible says it that way, it's an old private interpretation. It's the way the Bible said it. 
You know, if God calls all this heartaches and sorrows and death of babies and crying and wars and things because His Word was doubted by one phrase, will He take you back in anything less than that? Think it over. He doesn't change. His first decision has to always remain that decision. That's the reason He deals with one individual, not with a group, one. He can't change it. Well, I got a whole lot to say here, but I... Uh, Jesus' death was a phenomena. It was a paradox. The resurrection was a paradox. We believe that. Everybody knows the resurrection was a paradox. God raised him up from the dead. The new birth is a paradox. That's right. can change a man's being. We preach a sermon right here in a little bit. See? How a, a paradox to take a man that's a disbeliever, unbeliever, has nothing to do with it, and all at once change from a renegade to a saint, a prostitute to a sister. It's a paradox. No one can give him a medicine or a shot or a dose of medicine or anything else. It takes a hand of Almighty God and that alone to change a man's mind. It's a paradox when a man is born again. That's right. A paradox. It was a paradox when God chose 120 ignorant fishermen to take the news, the gospel at Pentecost around the world instead of the, uh, the great Sanhedrin council that was trained for it. Those who had trained and waited. And waited for the thing to happen. And God revealed Himself to a bunch of fishermen who couldn't even sign their own name to a piece of paper. A paradox. And God chose such as that instead of taking the, the ecumenical counsel of that day to do it. He'll do the same thing today. He's able of these stones to rise children unto Abraham. The prophet's visions has always been a paradox. How that those men by inspiration could foretell things that never fail. That's a paradox. How that's something beyond the human mind that you can't not comprehend. There are two conscious and subconscious that God gets into the subconscious, which is the real, and foresees, takes him out and sees things that was way back in another age, brings him down to present tense and tells the future, and it never fails any time. A paradox indeed. Incredible, but it's true. It happens just exactly... What we've seen him do last night was a paradox. Amen. Incredible to the human being. We can't explain it. A certain Baptist church that my little family went to the other day and they'd been down at the meeting in Tucson. The pastor got up not knowing that the boy that goes with my daughter is a, a member there. He said, you know, I just learned. Brother Branham's father and mother traveled in a, in a circus and said they were magicians. And that's a little trick that he does. See, I guess it was a trick that heals the sick. I doubt whether my father and mother ever seen a circus. They never seen an automobile till I had one. They never know nothing about it. But you see, the devil's always got to say, they told Jesus, they do this by Beelzebub. They had to answer something to their congregation. Why don't they search the Scriptures? See, this is predicted today. It's Jesus Christ. This the same yesterday as he was yesterday, he is today and will be forever. But that's it. See? That's just the, the way they try to do it. The Pentecostal uneducated, the prophet's visions. Jesus alive today after 2,000 years is a paradox too. It certainly is. I must close because it's getting late. You believe in paradox? Yes. Certainly. May I say this? One time an old druggist friend, kind old man, he said, Brother Branham, I'm going to tell you something. Said I. I know your ministry. And said I. I'm going to tell you. Said it might sound ridiculous, but said I haven't told it to people because they wouldn't believe it. But said I'm going to tell it to you. Let's go ahead. He said right in this same drugstore. He said during the time of the depression, I was sitting here. My boy, which now I'm married and runs a drugstore in another city, said he's waiting on customers and said. People had, said he had to go to, you remember when you had to go get an order from the county to get your medicine and whatever you had to have, you had to go get an order for it. said that uh, he seen a couple stagger in the door and said he looked poor, a little mother expecting, could hardly stand up a young woman. She was just walking and said the young man walked up to my son and said, I've got an order here for, the doctor sent me down to get an order rather from the county agent here that to get some medicine my wife needs it real bad and said she just can't stand it no longer said she's so sick 
doctor told me to get it right now and give it to her. So I wonder if I could get the medicine, give her the medicine, and she could sit down here and says, go take me two or three hours, stand that line before I can get my order for it. I said, I wonder if you could give me the medicine now. The young man said, sir, I'd like to do that. I said, I can't do it. He said, because that we have a, a rule here that we, it's a cash and carry basis. He said, we have to have it. And said, he sat back there reading a the paper, elderly man. He said, wait a minute, son. Look at that poor little woman who's holding like that. And so he said, go fill that order. He said, hand it here to me. So he took the prescription the doctor would give, went over there and filled it. He said, I filled it up. I thought, she never pays it all right. Don't make any difference. So said, I walked around to where she's at. I raised it over to give it to her hands. And said, so when I laid it in her hands, I looked up. I said, Brother Brown, I don't know where you believe it's not. I said, I put it in the hands of the Lord Jesus. So said, I seen him stand there looking at me and the blood running down his face and scars upon his head. I said, I shut my eyes like that. Kind of staggered. And I heard her husband say, Are you all right, doctor? And he said, Yes. I said, I looked back and the woman was holding the prescription. I said, You believe that? I said, Sure, I believe it. In so much as you've done of the least of these, my little ones, you have done it unto me. A paradox indeed. Many of you brothers here has read the writings of Saint of the saints of the early days. How that the Lord dealt with them. Paradox. How uh, things happen. We believe in paradox. One of the Saint Martin was one. I was trying to think of. See, he was a soldier. And in France, it was ordered that he, he should follow his father's work. But he always kind of believed. His mother was a believer. One cold day, he was a very humble man. They always furnished a man to polish his boots and keep him looking neat like a soldier should. He polished his servant's boots. He didn't go to their traditions and strains. He thought, man, we're made equal. So, one cold day, he was standing by the gate of the city of Taurus when he was going in. And so there laid an old beggar in the street. You've read it, no doubt, many times. There laid a beggar in the street, freezing to death, a real cold winter. He's begging people, come up, will somebody give me a cloak? I'll freeze tonight. I can't lay out on this ground like this. Will somebody give me a coat? Nobody. He said, please, somebody have mercy. An old man, I'm dying. I've served my time. I've done my best. Don't let me die. I'm freezing to death. Somebody wrap me up, will you? So he just stood back. St. Martin looking. He wasn't a believer. He wasn't a Christian then. He hadn't accepted it. He just stood and watched. Nobody did it. When the crowds went on by, some of them plenty well to do it. He only had one coat. That was his military coat. He pulled out his sword and cut it half in two. Wrapped the old beggar up in it and went on. People laughed at him going down the street. One piece of coat hanging on him. What a funny looking soldier they said it was. Made fun of him. That night he was woke up in his sleep. He looked standing beside his bed, and there stood Jesus wrapped in that old piece of coat that he had wrapped the beggar in. Then he knowed, in so much as you've done unto the least of these, my little one, it was a paradox, his call. He was a, he was a messenger of that age who stood for the Scripture against all the wickedness of Catholicism in that day. God chose him, and he let him see Christ by a paradox. Brethren, we may see paradox after paradox. The great paradox is coming ahead of us. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. And the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the resurrection comes and we're caught up together to meet him in the air. That'll be the final paradox. When we go to be with him. Until then, let's be faithful servants to the word of God, which is Christ. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank thee this morning for the blood that makes us brothers. We thank thee for the Son of God who gave his life that we might be one with him. In this great uh, kingdom upon the earth, the kingdom of heaven that's to be established, we're looking for that glad millennium day when our blessed Lord shall come and catch His waiting bride away. The little bride tree. He is that tree that was in the Garden of Eden, the bread of life. So is His little wife a tree. The bride tree of the last days. Where everything is tried to bring, but the great powers of God prunes the branches off that the fruit might ripen. Grant, Lord, that we can be included in that. Give us eternal life. 
We have this one thing together while we're here in this city. We believe the Word of God. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe that He's not dead, but He lives. And His words of promise for the hour is now being manifested. This is the last hours. This is the last sign. The coming of the, lo- the promised Son is at hand. We see the world geographically. We see the signs, earthquakes in diverse places, nations against nations. We see all the things as predicted. We see fearful sights in the skies, man's heart failing, flying saucers and so forth that they can't explain. Investigating judgments coming to the earth. We see the atomic bombs hanging out under everywhere and the great missiles can carry total destruction in an hour. We see the gases hanging above us there that would rain the fires down out of the heaven and destroy the earth. But we see Jesus also who made the promise. And as it said, this same Jesus that was taken up from you will come again in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. We're watching for that glad day to come. Our hearts, many of us, your Lord, for since little boys, we put forth every effort that we know how to serve you. Lord, don't let our eyes be blinded to this hour. Open my eyes, Lord, that I'll see every promise. May I be able to punctuate it with an amen that it's so. Everything that God has promised. Grant it, Lord. Give us a great meeting. Bless these, my brothers and sisters here. Some of these little women standing here, gray-headed, who served and, and taking care of their husbands while they worked out there in the fields. And God, you'll reward them. Those men who's fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas. So we sat here this morning around this table looking at one another and our hair is turning gray and we battle a long time and we may never meet at another breakfast. We don't know. The coming of the Lord may be today. It may be tomorrow. It may be next year. We don't know when it will be. But there's one thing sure. We're promised that we'll meet at a supper in the skies. And the king shall come out and wipe all tears from her eyes and say, don't worry, it's all over now. Enter into the joys of the Lord. That's been prepared for you since the foundation of the world. When we were ordained to be sons of God through Jesus Christ. Oh, Father God, grant this. May our hearts beat as one. And as I said a while ago to the little couple that was about to separate. God, as we separate from one another here. We found this one thing that we have in common. The Methodists, the Baptists. The United Assemblies, the Church of God. We all have one thing in common, Jesus Christ. We can't meet as organizations and fuss out them creeds and things of the church, but as brothers, we can meet under the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And there we have things in common. And upon this common ground, Lord, I come to meet my brothers, men of like precious faith. May we together in this coming week work with all that's within us to see the glory of God brought back to the church again. We commit everything to you with ourselves. In Jesus' name, bless our efforts. Amen. Bless you, my brethren. Did Brother Roy, did you have a word to say? This, how infallible the Word is. Jesus was the Word. We agree on that. When his parents had forgotten him and left him down at the feast and they had gone three days and couldn't find him, and they come back. We found him in the temple discussing with the priest, and they was amazed at this kid. We had no record of him going to school. But remember, he's just a boy, 12 years old, about this high. And watch the mother's statement. Now, no disregard to you Catholic people, if there's any in here. Calling her the mother of God. How can she be a mother of God? She is an incubator that God used. Not to look at her. If she's a mother of God, she actually had more wisdom in Him. Notice, once she's a mother, she gave Him life. She gave God life. See? Look here. She said, "Your father and I have sought you for day and night with tears." She discredited her first testimony. She called Joseph his father. I look at this 12-year-old boy, not knowing what he said. He was just a boy. But he was the Word. See? He said, Know ye not that I must be about my father's business? See the Word correct in the era? See? 
she was given testimony after he was raised up. It was all over now. She, see? Your father and I have sought you, going exactly what she said. She conceived this child by the Holy Ghost, then calling Joseph the father. And this little boy, 12-year-old child, no wisdom at all, what, but just a 12-year-old boy. The father didn't dwell in him at that time because he'd come on the day when he baptized him. He saw the Spirit of God coming down, see? And one hand. But look, this little 12 year old boy, being the word, he was born, Amen. the anointed one, see, to be the anointed. And here he was, Know ye not that I must be about my father's business? She said, Your father and I have been looking for you. If Joseph was his father, he'd have been with him on his business, making doors and houses. But he was in the temple, straightening out those organizations. Hmm? <laughs> know ye not that I must be about my father's business? Right. See, how the word of God corrected that error yes. in that child. Amen. God bless you.